Okay, today is the uh, 27th of July, and we continue with the Nidana Sangyutta. Hope to finish it tonight. Chapter 12.61. As have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Natha Pindika Spa, and he said, Monks, the uninstructed worldling, Putujana, my experience revulsion towards this body, composed of the four great elements. He might become dispassionate towards it and be liberated from it. For what reason? Because growth and decline as is seen in this body, composed of the four great elements. It is seen being taken up and laid aside. Therefore, the uninstructed worldling might experience revulsion towards this body, composed of the four great elements. He might become dispassionate towards it and be liberated from it. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is saying, uh, even an ordinary person, a uh, worldling, putujana, uh, he might be, uh, he might experience revulsion, uh, dispassion uh, towards this body, uh, because he can see uh, that this body, uh, after it grows, uh, then it will decline, it will age. Uh, so that's why uh, even an ordinary person uh, can see this uh, and become dispassionate towards it. Uh. But monks, as to that which is called mind and mentality and consciousness, the uninstructed worldling is unable to experience revulsion towards it, unable to become dispassionate towards it and be liberated from it. For what reason? Because for a long time this has been held to by him, appropriated and grasped thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Therefore, the uninstructed worldling is unable to experience revulsion towards it, unable to become dispassionate towards it and be liberated from it. Stop there for a moment. This one, uh, that which is called mind and mentality and consciousness, uh, the Pali word is citta, mano and vinyana. So here the Buddha says, uh, uh, it's very difficult uh, for an ordinary person uh, to be dispassionate uh, towards the mind. Uh, the, these three terms, uh, uh, these three terms indicate the mind in, in its various ways of working. Uh, the mentality, mano here is more of the thinking faculty. The consciousness is more of the consciousness of the sixth sense, yours. Uh, and the Buddha says, because uh, for a long time uh, an ordinary person uh, has grasped, uh, is attached to the mind uh, as this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Uh. You see, this mind, uh, the, this, the, our mind, uh, is our self-defense system, our ego support system. Uh, uh, because we have the mind, uh, it, the mind is, is what... Uh, supports our ego because uh, uh, we protect ourselves uh, by using the mind. Whenever there's any danger, uh, we use our mind. Uh, so uh, when we want anything, we use our mind. You, you want to achieve success, uh, so you, you have to use your mind a lot. Uh, so all the time we are using our mind. Uh, so it's very difficult to let go uh, of this mind. And the Buddha continued, It would be better, monks, for the uninstructed worldling to take as self this body composed of the four great elements rather than the mind. For what reason? Because this body composed of the four great elements is seen standing for one year, for two years, for three, four, five, or ten years, or twenty, thirty, forty, or fifty years, for a hundred years, or even longer. But that which is called mind and mentality and consciousness arises as one thing and ceases as another by day and by night. This as a monkey roaming through a forest grabs hold of one branch, that's, lets that go and grabs another, then lets that go and grabs still another. So too, that which is called mind and mentality and consciousness arises as one thing and ceases as another by day and by night. Stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha is saying uh, that an ordinary person uh, is there will be more reason uh, to take the to take this body as the self uh, rather than to take the mind. 
but the only person uh, takes the mind uh, more to be the self uh, rather than the body because he sees the body can grow old, can sicken, can die. But the Buddha says, uh, in actual fact, uh, he should take the body more to be the self rather than the mind. Why? Because the mind actually also uh, changes, uh, just like age and die, uh, and even much faster. Uh, the Buddha says, uh, whereas the body can last a hundred years or even more, but the mind uh, is changing all the time. Uh, day and night, uh, it is changing, and changing so fast, uh, just like the monkey uh, grabbing a branch and let go and grab another branch. Uh. So also the mind, uh, in fact, there's nothing faster than the mind. Uh, nothing works faster than the mind. So uh, even in one second, uh, the mind can be so active uh, 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 within one second. Uh, so uh, it's uh, changing all the time. Uh, it's, it's grabbing one object uh, uh, and, and letting go and grab another mental object and let go and grab another mental object. Uh, that's why like a monkey. Uh, so the Buddha says, uh, actually the mind, because it's changing much faster, uh, although we don't see it, uh, we, we think uh, the mind is a stream of continuous consciousness, uh, never stopping. But actually, the mind arises and passes away, arises and passes away, arises and passes away. Uh, within one second itself, uh, I don't know how many times it arises and passes away. Uh. So that being so, uh, the Buddha is saying uh, the mind is even more impermanent than the body, whereas the body can last 100 over years, and yet the mind uh, cannot last even one second. Therein monks, the, un the instructed noble disciple attends closely and carefully to dependent origination itself thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the rising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with ignorance as condition, volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness, etc. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of volition. With the cessation of volition, cessation of consciousness, etc. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Seeing thus monks, the instructed noble disciple experiences revulsion towards form, revulsion towards feeling, revulsion towards perception, revulsion towards volition, revulsion towards consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. So towards the end, uh, the Buddha says, uh, the learned uh, Aryan disciple, uh, having um, understood dependent origination, uh, that everything arises and ceases through conditions, uh, then he, he feels this fashion uh, towards five aggregates, uh, namely uh, form or body, uh, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. These five things, these five aggregates, uh, uh, also can be said to be body and mind, uh, because we always take the body and mind to be the self, uh, or as belonging to the self, uh, or the self in the five aggregates, or the five aggregates in the self. Uh. Uh, so when he understands uh, that the body and the mind uh, is all conditionally arisen, uh, then uh, he experiences dispassion uh, and revulsion, and so his mind becomes liberated. Uh. So this sutta, uh, uh, the main point about this sutta is that uh, uh, although uh, we, you know, uh, because we can see uh, the body ages uh, and sickens and dies, uh, so. It is easier, easier to let go of the body uh, rather than the mind. Uh, but the Buddha says, uh, in actual fact, uh, there is more reason uh, to let go of the mind rather than the body because uh, the mind, uh, at least the body, uh, uh, stands longer than the mind. But uh, you see, uh, when a person becomes uh, um, first stage Arya, when a person enters the stream, um, and then after that, he becomes uh, first fruit area, Sotapanna. Sotapanna eliminates three factors, uh, attachment to rules and vows or rituals, uh, and then uh, attachment, uh, identity view, Sakaya Diti, uh, and doubt. Uh. Now, this Sakaya Diti, uh, 
if a person uh, eliminates a kind identity, identity view, uh, it means uh, he sees uh, that the body and the self uh, is not, is not, uh, is not. Uh, there's no self, uh, There's no permanent. Uh, there's nothing permanent uh, in the body and the mind. Uh, the five aggregates. Uh, yet, uh, he still has a self. Uh, so this self, uh, where is that self? It's somewhere in the mind. Uh, <laughs> So uh, he doesn't really understand where it is. Uh, so when a person uh, becomes an Arya, and, but not yet uh, uh, Arahan, uh, so he's, he has let go of his body and the mind. Uh, he, he sees uh, that the body and the mind is not the self, and yet he still has uh, this uh, self somewhere. Uh. 12.63, Matsabhati. Buddha said, monks, there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. But for the nutriment, edible food, gross or subtle. Second, contact. Third, volition. Fourth, consciousness. These are the four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. And how monks should the nutriment, edible food, be seen. Suppose a couple, husband and wife, had taken limited provisions and were traveling through a desert. They have with them their only son, dear and beloved. Then, in the middle of the desert, their limited provisions will be used up and exhausted, while the rest of the desert remains to be crossed. The husband and wife would think, our limited provisions have been used up and exhausted, while the rest of this desert remains to be crossed. Let us kill our only son dear and beloved, and prepared dry and spice meat. By eating our son's flesh, we can cross the rest of, the, of this desert. Let not all three of us perish. Then monks, the husband and wife would kill their only son, dear and beloved, prepare dry and spice meat, and by eating their son's flesh, they would cross the rest of the desert. While they are eating their son's flesh, they would beat their breasts and cry, Where are you, our only son? Where are you, our only son? What do you think, monks? Would they eat that food for amusement or for enjoyment or for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness? No, Venerable Sir. Wouldn't they eat that food only for the sake of crossing the desert? Yes, Venerable Sir. It is in such a way, monks, that I say the nutriment edible food should be seen. When the nutriment edible food is fully understood, Lust for the five causes of sensual pleasure is fully understood. When lust for the five causes of sensual pleasure is fully understood, there is no factor bound by which a noble disciple I come back again to this world. I stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha says uh, we should consider uh, the food we eat uh, as though being the flesh uh, of our only son. Uh, and then we won't uh, be greedy uh, for tasty food. Uh. Um, that uh, can be understood uh, by thinking uh, whether the food, uh, whether we eat is meat uh, or even veggie, uh, vegetables, uh, um, it's still uh, it's as, it's at the expense of some beings. Uh, some beings have to die uh, for us to survive. Uh. So if we eat meat, uh, that is seen more clearly. Uh, but if we eat vegetarian food, uh, still uh, uh, other beings uh, have to die for it uh, because the farmers who uh, plant the crops, uh, they will naturally kill all the pests uh, that destroy their crops. Uh, like uh, in Malaysia, you have monkeys and squirrels and rats and uh, in other countries, maybe rabbits and uh, kangaroos and smaller creatures like worms, caterpillars. Uh, insects, etc. Uh, so whatever we eat, uh, it's always at the expense of other beings. So if we consider that, uh, we should not be greedy for good food. Uh, just see uh, that we have to consume the food uh, to survive. And our purpose of survival, uh, we should have a purpose. Uh, there's no point uh, if we uh, survive uh, at the expense of other living beings uh, and waste our life. Uh. So in this case, uh, this husband and wife, uh, they have to cross the desert. Uh. And this is uh, an analogy uh, for the sea of the desert of Samsara. Uh. 
if we want to cross the desert of samsara, we have to survive uh, and, and live the holy life, uh, uh, practice the, the Dhamma uh, to get out of samsara. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, food uh, should be considered in that way. Uh, uh, we owe a debt to others, uh, other beings uh, that we have to uh, eat uh, at the expense of their lives. Uh, uh, so if we consider like that, uh, then we are not greedy. Uh, and then also we make good use of our life uh, to uh, benefit ourselves and to benefit others. Uh, not live our life aimlessly, uh, a lot of people, uh, because they don't understand the Dhamma. They live their life aimlessly uh, and they never get out of samsara. Not to get out of samsara is not so bad. The only problem is uh, they'll be falling to the woeful planes uh, again and again uh, to suffer. So the Buddha says, uh, when you have understood uh, the ed- nutriment, ed- edible food in this way, uh, then uh, the lust for the sensual pleasure, uh, you will not, uh, you will reduce your lust for sensual pleasure uh, because you know uh, the longer we live uh, uh, and enjoy life, uh, it, the more we uh, hurt others. Uh. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, as they say, it's a dog eat dog world. Uh. Each person uh, survives uh, at the expense of others. And how long should the nutriment contact be seen? Suppose there is a flayed cow. That means a skin cow, a cow with the skin removed. If she stands exposed to a wall, the creatures dwelling in the wall would nibble at her. If she stands exposed to a tree, the creatures dwelling in the tree would nibble at her. If she stands exposed to water, the creatures dwelling in the water would nibble at her. If she stands exposed to the open air, the creatures in the open air would nibble at her. Whatever that clay, that flayed cow stands exposed to, the creatures there would nibble at her. It is in such a way, monks, that I say the nutriment contact should be seen. When the nutriment contact is fully understood, the three kinds of feeling are fully understood. When the three kinds of feeling are fully understood, I say there is nothing further that a noble disciple needs to do. Let's stop here for a moment. This uh, cow uh, uh, is a cow with the skin removed. Uh. So if the skin is removed, uh, the flesh, uh, uh, other creatures will like to bite the flesh, uh, to eat the flesh. Uh. So whether she is standing, uh, touching a wall, uh, when she stands touching a wall, then the wall, the creatures in, in the wall would bite her. Uh. If she stands against a tree, Creatures in the tree would bite her. La. If she stands in the water, creatures in the water would bite her. La. In the open air, creatures in the open air would bite her. La. Uh, this um, refers uh, to our six sense basis. At uh, the six sense basis, uh, contact uh, means contact with external sense object. La. That means uh, for the eye, uh, is forms. La. Forms will uh, make contact with us. La. Sounds will make contact, smells, taste, touch, and thoughts uh, would make contact. Uh. And when it makes contact, uh, then uh, feeling arises. Uh. Uh, this feeling uh, uh, can be pleasant, can be unpleasant, can be neutral. Uh. Uh, but when the unpleasant feeling arises, uh, then we feel pain. Uh. Uh, so each time unpleasant feeling arises, we, pay, we feel pain. Uh. So in the same way, uh, just like the contact, Touching us uh, gives rise to painful feelings. Uh. So this cow uh, with the skin removed, uh, every time the, the little creatures uh, come into contact with her body, uh, uh, and then she feels pain. Uh. So uh, uh, then the Buddha says uh, that is how uh, we should understand contact. Uh. So you see, uh, uh, this contact comes at the six sense doors. Uh, okay, and this six sense doors. Uh, uh, whenever the sixth sense consciousness arises, uh, the world arises. Uh. So uh, the world uh, at the six senses uh, always gives us uh, pleasant and unpleasant feelings, uh, and neutral feelings. Uh. The pleasant feelings, however much we experience, uh, is never enough. But when the unpleasant feelings arise, uh, we cannot stand. Okay, uh, So that's why... Uh, uh, the world uh, is called uh, a world of suffering. Uh, samsara is a world of suffering. So a liberated person, uh, the arahant, uh, does not like to dwell in the world of the six senses, uh, in the world of the six consciousness. Uh, an arahant, uh, if you look into the suttas, um, 
after they have become liberated, uh, they constantly, every day, uh, abide in jhana. When a monk abides in jhana, he goes into his mind. He withdraws from the world of the six senses. Uh, because the world of the six senses uh, is an unpleasant world. It's a world of suffering. Okay? Uh, so, uh, Arhan uh, constantly abides in his mind. Uh, so, there are some people who don't understand. They say monks uh, who like to abide in jhana, uh, not seeing reality, <laughs> running away from reality, trying to, uh, just like some people renounce, uh, and people who don't understand, uh, worldly people uh, say, this person renounced to become a monk, uh, he's running away from reality, uh, not facing the world and all that. It's rubbish, uh, because the world is not a pleasant place at all. That's why the Buddha says, uh, even to exist for a moment more, uh, he doesn't want, the Buddha says, uh, the, the world to him uh, is like shit, uh, the excrement is stated, is stated in the suttas. Uh. So, a wise man uh, will go back into our mind. That is our original home, as Sajan Cha says, going back to our original home. And how much should the nutriment mental volition be seen? Suppose there is a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, filled with glowing coals without flame or smoke. A man would come along wanting to live, not wanting to die, desiring happiness and averse to suffering. Then two strong men would grab him by both arms and drag him towards the charcoal pit. The man's volition would be to get away. His longing would be to get away. His wish would be to get away, to get far away from the charcoal pit. For what reason? Because he knows, I will fall into this charcoal pit, and on that account I will meet death or deadly suffering. It is in such a way, monks, that I say the nutriment mental volition to be seen, should be seen. When the nutriment mental volition is fully understood, the three kinds of craving are fully understood. When the three kinds of craving are fully understood, I say there is nothing further that a noble disciple needs to do. I, see, uh, I stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the Buddha is saying, uh, because of mental volition, uh, uh, when, uh, whenever we exercise mental volition, uh, mental volition can be exercised in various ways. Uh, like we we desire to do this, desire not to do to do that. Uh. In a way, when we exercise our mental volition, uh, that is creating karma, and also. When we crave for something, there's also uh, mental volition. Crave for sensual pleasure. We crave for existence. Or we crave for non-existence. Or the will to live. Uh, we have a strong will to live. Uh, there is also mental volition. But basically, uh, the Buddha says, uh, like this man uh, falling into that pit. Uh, falling into that pit means falling into samsara. Falling into the round of rebirths. Uh, once you fall into the round of rebirths, uh, you will suffer, suffer and uh, or die. Uh, but it's a continuous process. Uh, you suffer and die, suffer and die, suffer and die. Each time, uh, each time, every lifetime. Uh, so uh, that uh, the Buddha says uh, we should see uh, because of our mental volition uh, that uh, we are dragged into the round of rebirths. Uh, but in the Buddha's teachings, uh, um, the Buddha says, uh, that the round of rebirths uh, is primarily uh, due to craving. craving. So you can see uh, that the mental volition uh, is connected with craving. Uh, and the Buddha always mentions three types of craving. Craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, which is also the will to live, uh, and craving for non-existence. Uh, uh, so uh, when you understand uh, the nutriment mental volition in this way, uh, then the three kinds of craving are understood. Uh, uh, so we have to let go of uh, this uh, mental volition, uh, basically the craving, uh, the various types of craving. Uh, then only, uh, we don't fall into that uh, pit, uh, that burning pit of rebirth. Uh. And how much should the nutriment consciousness be seen? Suppose they were to arrest a bandit, a criminal, and bring him before the king, saying, Sire, this man is a bandit, a criminal. Impose on him whatever punishment you wish. The king says to them, Go, men, in the morning strike this man with a hundred spears. In the morning they strike him with a hundred spears. Then at noon the king asks, Men, how is that man? Still alive, sire. Then go at noon and strike him with a hundred spears. 
At noon, they strike him with a hundred spears. Then in the evening, the king asks, Men, how is that man? Still alive, sire. And he says, Then go, and in the evening, strike him with a hundred spears. In the evening, they strike him with a hundred spears. What do you think, monks? Would that man, being struck with three hundred spears, experience pain and displeasure on that account? Remember, sir, even if he were struck with one spear, he would experience pain and displeasure on that account, not to speak of three hundred spears. And the Buddha said, It is in such a way, monks, that I say the Newtonian consciousness should be seen. When the Newtonian consciousness is fully understood, name and form is fully understood. When name and form is fully understood, I say there is nothing further that a noble disciple needs to do. And that's the end of the sutta. So here, finally, yeah, the simile for the Newtonian consciousness uh, is like a criminal uh, being struck with 300 spears uh, each day. Uh. So my interpretation uh, is that uh, like the embryo, uh, the consciousness descends into that embryo uh, and then uh, uh, this being starts. So when he is conscious, uh, he is the consciousness uh, uh, strikes him like this uh, man uh, being struck uh, with the 300 spears. Uh. Every time he is conscious uh, uh, in the womb, uh, he experiences pain. Uh, and uh, consciousness uh, is always conscious of nama rupa, uh, mentality, materiality. Uh. Uh, so uh, that's why when you understand consciousness, uh, you will understand nama rupa, uh, mentality and materiality. Uh. Uh, but uh, let me see what the commentary says about this. Uh, uh, one, six, eight. Commentary says, uh, The king represents karma, the criminal, the worldling, the 300 spears, the rebirth consciousness. The time the king gives his command is like the time the worldling is driven towards rebirth by king karma. Pain from being struck by the spears is like the resultant suffering in the course of existence once rebirth has taken place. Uh, so it's uh, a bit similar uh, when the rebirth consciousness uh, uh, goes into the embryo. Uh, so uh, once he's that being in the embryo, once he's, he's come alive, uh, then the consciousness uh, is painful uh, to him. So because that being in the embryo uh, is like uh, half alive, uh, like this man, uh, this criminal is struck by the hundred spears each time, uh, he's already half dead. <laughs> so in the same way, uh, the embryo uh, is half dead, uh, half alive. So every time the consciousness comes to him, uh, it's like being struck with spears. So that's the sutta. Now 12.64, that's Savati. Monks, there are these four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. But for the nutriment, edible food, gross or subtle. Second, contact. Third, mental volition or volition. Fourth, consciousness. These are the four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the assistance of those about to come to be. If monks, there is lust for the nutriment edible, edible food. If there is delight, if there is craving, consciousness becomes established and comes to growth. Wherever consciousness becomes established and comes to growth, there is a descent of name and form or nama, nama rupa, mentality, materiality. Where there is a descent of mentality and materiality, there is the growth of, volis, of volition. Where there is the growth of volition, there is the production of future renewed existence. Where there is the production of future renewed existence, there is future birth, aging and death. Where there is future birth, aging and death, I say that it is accompanied by sorrow, anguish and despair. Similarly, yeah, if there is lust for the nutriment contact uh, or for the nutriment mental volition or for the nutriment consciousness, uh, if there is del delight, if there is craving, consciousness becomes established and comes to growth. Whether consciousness becomes established and comes to growth, I see it, that it is accompanied by sorrow, anguish and despair. Suppose monks, an artist or a painter, using dye or lac or term turmeric or indigo or crimson, could create the figure of a man or a woman complete in all its features on a well-polished plank or wall or canvas. So too, if there is lust 
for the nutriment edible food or for the nutriment contact or for the nutriment mental volition or for the nutriment consciousness if there is delight if there is craving consciousness becomes established there and comes to growth where consciousness comes established becomes established and comes to growth i say that it is accompanied by sorrow anguish and despair if monks there is no lust for the nutriment edible food or for the nutriment contact or for the nutriment mental volition or for the nutriment consciousness if there is no delight if there is no craving consciousness does not become established there and come to growth where consciousness does not become established and come to growth there is no descent of mentality materiality where there is no descent of mentality and materiality there is no growth of volition of volition where there is no growth of volition there is no production of future renewed existence where there is no production of future renewed existence there is no future birth aging and death where there is no future birth aging and death i say that it is without sorrow anguish and despair suppose monks there was a house or a wall or a hall with a peak roof with windows on the northern southern and eastern sides and the sun rises and a beam of light enters through a window where would it become established on the western wall when was sir if there were no western wall where would it become established on the earth when was sir if there were no earth where would it become established on the water when was sir if there were no water where would it become established it would not become established anywhere when was sir so two months if there is no lust for the nutriment edible food for the nutriment contact for the nutriment mental volition for the nutriment consciousness consciousness does not become established there and come to growth where consciousness does not become established and come to growth i see that it is without sorrow anguish and despair is the end of the sutta earlier we read a sutta saying that uh, if there is uh, planning to do this and do that uh, uh, or there is a tendency towards something then the consciousness uh, will be maintained so it also says uh, if there is no planning and desire uh, but there is still a tendency uh, then consciousness will also continue to uh, be maintained uh. so here in this case uh, this uh, last for the nutrients uh, the various types of nutrients uh, uh will prolong the prolong existence uh, uh, prolong life uh, uh. so if there is no last uh, for the various nutrients uh, as there is no condition for consciousness to be come established uh, just like this uh, beam of light na uh, if there's no wall for it na uh, no floor for it na uh, to become established i uh, would not become established anywhere uh.